When you think about uh, the kinds of things that bring us back and, and create more knowledge and depth of understanding of what our community was built on, how we came together, how we fought fascism in the 1930s and the 1940s. I mean, this, this story of, the, of the, the, the crew that won the gold medal is, is a relatively small story, but it's so emblematic of something that we, I think, many people are not in touch with, and I think it's important to preserve that. There's a lot of power in knowing your roots and where you come from. Um, and I hope that we can share their stories and really recognize that they live on through us um, as we continue to focus on the restoration and make it a space for people to come back to um, and remember their ancestors. It's home to the inspiring true story of the American pursuit of gold in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. A national treasure steeped in history this side of the Northwest. And a waterfront landmark that served many in sailing, aviation, rowing, and military operations through time. Now standing at over 100 years old, it's time to give it new life. In this field report, we take a step back into history and a leap forward into the future of the ASUW Shell House. In the summer of 1936, Hitler was on a mission to prove Aryan supremacy in athletics as Germany hosted the Summer Olympics of that year. August 14th was a chilly day in Berlin. Germany has been bagging gold medals left and right, claiming the lead to Hitler's satisfaction. But unbeknownst to him, an unlikely group of athletes from humble blue-collar towns of Washington state was about to challenge the glory of the Third Reich, as the whole world watched in shock and disbelief. The crowd has begun to yell, and particularly when the German crews are up near the start, they begin to yell, Deutschland, Deutschland, Deutschland. As a crowd of Germans, 75,000 strong, cheered in anticipation of the men's eight rowing competition, the American crew from the University of Washington faced the worst of odds. Don Hume, the stroke of the crew, who set the pace for the rest of the oarsmen behind him, suffered from a severe respiratory illness and had a high-grade fever just before the day of the race. Then, they were assigned lane 6. Located at the rear end of the race, this was dubbed the worst lane placement for any team and would force the husky oarsmen to row against the strongest winds and the roughest chop. They already had a losing start. They failed to hear the signal that started the race from where they were, and Hume was unable to respond to Cox and Bobby Mock's calls to pick up speed. Defeat seemed inevitable, and the focus shifted solely on Italy and Germany, who were more likely to win. Until the 1900-meter mark, when, in a famed miraculous feat, they shot in the lead, overtaking Germany and then Italy. The American crew is in the lead now. The American crew is in front. They're not leading by more than a deck length. It's very, very close. Tell them yell. In the last 10 strokes, at a rate of 44 strokes per minute. The United States wins with Italy second and Germany third, Great Britain fourth, and Hungary fifth, and not one boat length between the first five. The Huskies claimed victory by a difference of 8 feet. At 6 minutes 25 seconds, a sixth of a second to Italy, and a full second over Germany, baffling Hitler and the rest of the world while putting Washington state on the map. 
Theirs was a classic David and Goliath story, an unimaginable triumph against the fascist elite by the boys from a town unheard of in a country that was tight in the grips of the Great Depression. And this was where it all began. In the 1930s, Seattle was just a backwater town where nine boys from families of fishermen, farmers, and loggers who had neither gone to Ivy League schools nor touched an oar in their life found rowing as a way out of the economic fallout from the Great Depression. To most athletes at the time, rowing was an exclusively elite sport undertaken by sons of tycoons, bankers, and rich landowners. But to these unassuming young men, it was a means to survive. This group of guys that just kind of came out of nowhere, out of Seattle, out of the Seattle area, out of the Washington area, era, you know, in a time when we still were seen as like, you know, being from the frontier. When we got off the train, there would be people lined around the train to watch Washington get off of the train because they'd never seen anybody from the West Coast. And this is where they trained. Tucked behind the trees of the Montley Cut waterfront is the ASUW Shell House. Bordered by Lake Washington to its west and Union Bay its east, it sits quietly under the shadow of the great Husky Stadium, cavernous yet unostentatious. The 10,000 square foot structure was built on Duwamish land, used by Native Americans as a canoe carrying place before the Montley Cut Ship Canal was created in 1917. It was a hangar for naval seaplanes in the First World War, before becoming a training facility for Husky oarsmen. Now it stands as one of the only two remaining hangars from World War I, and the only one to have housed seaplanes. In the 1970s, the ASUW Shell House also earned its spot on the National Register of Historic Places. Today, it's immortalized by author Daniel James Brown in his New York Times bestseller, The Boys in the Boat. I think the story of The Boys in the Boat resonates with so many people because it reminds us of what we're capable of. It reminds us that we're capable of overcoming great adversity. In some ways, it's sort of a metaphor for the American people that we do best when we pull together. What Boys in the Boat brought was a story about resilience, teamwork, bonding, trust. It's a real story about real things that we as humans value very highly. The old show house is the material place where that transpired. And so it's almost like a place for people to come back and experience what they read in the book, experience it personally. The Shell House also served as a craft space for four-time Olympic boatman George Pocock, a world-renowned boat builder who was known to craft rowing shells that were superior in structure and speed, including the Husky Clipper, the shell used by the boys when they won gold in the Berlin Olympics. His shells were sought after even by teams that competed against the University of Washington, and he was also a well-respected mentor and rowing advisor. By the mid-1930s, every collegiate rowing program in the country either had or desperately wanted to have Pocock-built shells. They were state-of-the-art. They were beautiful to behold, but they're also just faster than anybody else's shells. So out of this shell house, he was producing the boats that um, Princeton and Yale and Penn and Navy and all these great rowing powers um, were using. The boys in the boat captured the attention of Hollywood director George Clooney, who expressed interest in making a feature film based on the book. In 2018, the Shell House was officially appointed a Seattle landmark. In the same year, the University of Washington embarked on a $13 million campaign to transform the old Shell House to a modern multifunctional facility that will serve as a central hub for students and the community, as well as a place to showcase its historic legacy. The state granted $100,000 towards the campaign via the state capital budget. It's basically part of our budget process where uh, the state is able to invest in the infrastructure of the state. 
buildings and university systems and water systems and, and public infrastructure that our communities might need. We finance the investments in the state of Washington and so many of them involve buildings on universities campuses like the University of Washington and others. It's just a really special space for a lot of people when they come up here they get quite emotional sometimes. Nicole Klein who has the campaign shares the vision for the renovation. This building needed to be something that was privately supported because it is uh, unique in that it's not serving a primary academic purpose and we basically came to the idea that it needed to be a place to gather, to connect with the water, to connect with history, um, and also this sort of intersection between UW students and the community, which is a really rare role for a historic building to play and definitely unique on campus. It'll have the patina and that age that makes it really special, and there's not many places in Seattle that really celebrate that. It will still remain, remain humble and authentic and genuine to who it is. We don't want to have it so built up that you can't feel what we're feeling right now. It will be something that will be sought after as a tourist attraction. She also shares how the state grant money will be used. I think the first probable use would be to help us through the final design and permitting cost phase, which we hope to embark on soon. Um, and that would go towards permitting, um, design plans and all the work that helps you get to the construction phase. The money raised via the campaign will help fund a campus hub where students can gather for meetings and classes or hang out at an on-site cafe. A cultural center welcoming the public to interact with historical exhibits and timelines. And a gathering space for conferences, special events and celebrations. The new Shell House will also pay homage to legendary boat builder George Pocock by recreating his workshop as an exhibit space and commissioning local boat builders to carry on his legacy by hosting an active workshop. When we move in all the machinery and tools um, that have been saved up in Port Townsend, um, it will be authentically like George stepped away for a minute and it's all there. Recreating that smell and the sounds that were um, native to this building and holds so many memories. So this building will be brought back to life in a lot of ways. Here is his signature logo. It says George Pocock, University Station, Seattle, Washington. And most people, they might not know that the Pocock Racing Shells business is still alive and well up in Everett. Um, not, no longer making them out of wood, but still some of the fastest racing shells in the world. Since the success of Brown's book, Visitors from all over the world have traveled here to relish the historic space that set the stage for the incredible story of the boys in the boat. Thousands of people have come here through the University of Washington and the Conover Shell House especially because it touched them in some way and they want to see the, the Husky Clipper, they want to see Joe Rance's Olympic gold medal, they want to touch maybe Don Hume's Olympic gold medal or... Former Husky rower Melanie Barstow made it her passion to host guided tours of the old Shell House as well as the renovated Conibear Shell House half a mile away, where the original Husky Clipper now hangs, along with historic memorabilia from the 1936 Olympics. We've hosted, you know, close to 9,000 people from all over the world. I've had people into this space and kind of tear up a little bit. Some people have just been reflective about, you know, family members that have passed away, and for me, that's really. Um, the greatest gift of being a tour guide is welcoming people into these doors, but seeing the emotion that it evokes just by being in this space. This building, there's so many, you know, glorious stories that have been through its doors. It is so humble, <laughs> and you would never think that Olympians rode out of here. You would never think that it's one of only two still standing World War I airplane hangars. And I think that there's an authenticity that you can't really draw from any other space like it. Melanie hopes to resume tours in the future while plans of hosting virtual tours are being considered at this time. With a film in the works, a bestseller, and a guided tour that's largely well received, supporters of the campaign look forward to the restoration. This building brings together wood and water, it brings together boat building and rowing and endeavor and fair play and community spirit it brings together a lot of the sort of values and attitudes that 
embodies Seattle or that defines Seattle. In some ways, it's the last living witness to the era that I write about in The Boys in the Boat. Having it brought back to life, having young people and students and old people come in and learn about the building and learn about the history of what happened here. To me, that's really what, it, what it's all about, is giving voice to the building and to what the building has seen. I can see an amazing facility that ties our region, our state, our city, and our university. The spot right here trained flyers who became staples of our modern military. We are an aerospace juggernaut in Washington State. We have uh, military bases here, but many of that, much of that maybe came from right here where, where flyers were trained and their planes were stored. And I think the fact that we had a role in that is something that's to be preserved and people should uh, understand the history of where, where we came from so we can move forward together. With layers of history under its timber, the ASUW Shell House is, no doubt, poised to serve a new purpose in the next 100 years, carrying over its legacy from the last century and immortalizing those who shaped its legendary past. Three pounds. How long is it? 26 feet. Harmony, balance, and rhythm. They are the three things that stay with you your whole life. Without them, civilization is out of whack. And that's why an oarsman, when he goes out in life, he can fight it, he can handle life. And that's what he gets from rowing. Harmony, balance, and rhythm. Mark those words. For a field report, this is Angela Nolasco.